I think we have summarized our concept, Diana. But anyway, we have concentrated on the question of autonomy as well, as a problematic word, as any other word. So and so, um, referring to the specific context in which autonomy emerges is very important then, and also uh, considering the other um, existing or emerging concepts of autonomy and how do they relate to our production of autonomy for a particular uh, moment in our careers. And also, uh, we have considered how important it is to establish more dialogues with the other areas, because we usually look at literacies, multiliteracies, neoliteracies, education, and the teaching of foreign language. But now, as your text uh, um, claims, as you claim, uh, planetary education is very important then. So, uh, in other words, how a complex uh, process of being autonomous <laughs> connects to other multiplicities uh, at the same time. So we have to balance the affordances, the possibilities, and the, the limitations. So, and from this, uh, towards what? So that will depend on the institutional aims and personal aims too, because we have the <laughs> to negotiate ethics. Who doesn't have to? Uh, but I, uh, um, as I did um, postdoc, postdoctoral research on ethics with Limario under the supervision of Limario, uh, Paulo. Uh, uh, yes, we have to have the projects approved. Uh, and they are stronger than us, researchers, educators, uh, but this shouldn't be an obstacle, yes? So we can promote ruptures, disruptures inside or from uh, across and within you know, these environments. Just like getting to the classroom, closing the door and, you know, trying to make a difference. And this is, uh, this might be a possibility, yes? Uh, but it's important to be aware of uh, our uh, of uh, these um, this limitation. To what extent can we do certain things and negotiate constantly? Negotiate with the authorities, uh, with the students, with the participants. Because even the participant participants of uh, of our research are uh, becoming have it becoming more powerful now. Yes, if we consider technologies. Can teach us easily now. So it's not only about this top-down view, but also you know, more bottom-up processes too. Yeah. And negotiation uh, uh, is a key word. I don't. I think so. Transgression. Transgression. Yeah. Structures, structures, and this is what we do. What about someone from the, the back here? Well, okay. Um, we started uh, thinking about um, the possibility of uh, constructing an autonomous space for agency. Um, and we came up with the metaphor of a boat. A boat in which all those who wish to join can come in, whatever their strange multiplicity, whatever resources they have, they'll be welcome. And the reason that uh, the boat has an advantage as a concept, as a metaphor, is that it's moving in the direction, but it's, mov it's moving in a common direction with all the multiplicity possible in the hemisphere, doing something, driving it forward. Everyone has a chance to um, bring the resources that they have from their profession, from their life, from their history, from their interests, to um, promote what eventually could be a, um, an urgent action project, which would um, define its purpose, would be in motion, would be uh, fundamentally collegial and self-governing, but would be um, unalterably plural while moving forward. 
Um, since it's a virtual boat, um, anyone can join. It will be hooked up across the Americas. It can include uh, special interest groups. It can eventually translate into um, vocational questions. It can eventually historicize itself. It is, uh, I think, committed to uh, an ecological kind of thinking rather than a postmodern kind of thinking. And it is fundamentally ethical, but ethical in the sense that um, ethics include uh, Mother Earth. And of course, uh, that is an Aboriginal concept. Um, so it has a wide ecological commitment. I think people said, well, suppose I am you know, bored by the boat and I want to just stand on the shore. Um, we'll keep in touch uh, electronically. Fine. Uh, suppose I speak a language that um, you know, no one else on the boat speaks. We are committed to a translation and interpretation throughout the Americas. Every language in the Americas, including accepted languages and indigenous languages, just like Tusayi, uh, Tusayi's policy. And uh, this concept of a metaphor, a metaphoric boat, that is also a responsible boat, okay, is something that um, used to be on a Canadian bill, a $20 bill. There was the uh, kind of wide boat of Bill Reed. And our current government uh, removed it and replaced it with a, um, a monument to a, um, uh, a Canadian victory, military victory in the First World War. So officially, Canada is against this boat. It doesn't want the strange multiplicity of people moving in a common direction with all the, uh, the messiness that that involves. But I think we're a boat that um, embraces messiness and discovers its direction by the rowing of the thing. Would you like to continue uh, adding to this or shaping it in a different way, fellow paddlers? I'd like to say that that metaphor, the title, Strange Multiplicity, is the title of a book by James Tully, a Canadian political philosopher. Uh, working through notions of uh, Canadian multiculturalism and cross-cultural negotiation. So there's a citation behind that image of the boat. Uh, and then, of course, I can't help thinking of Noah's Ark as well. Um, I, I think we need to think of creative metaphors to describe sociality, to describe being with, to describe community, and singularity and how it can operate um, in these kinds of ways. Um, I wouldn't be happy with any single <laughs> image, but that's another image to throw in. I mean, what I like about Spivak is, is her argument that we have to move away from the image of the family as the dominant image for community, for, for, for the social. So you're offering an alternative to the family. She offers uh, rhizome and uh, creology and, and other alternatives. Um, did anyone else in the group have uh, yeah, something else to add? Yeah. Yeah, there's something I discussed briefly during our group discussion. And, and again, I'm not sure about the literature use of what I have to say, but I'd like to have um, you know, impressions about that. Um, that you know, something that's specifically like hailed, that was really hailed by when I was looking at the text is like um, Spivak's early definition of planetarity that she articulates to the, uh, to, to the idea of like pre-capitalist um, societies and that, that there was something that I found a bit troubling and um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll try to be brief. Um, and, and there's also like a few other concepts, like the going back to idea of like the rhizomatic and like like post-structural and post-colonial ideas like that. And it reminded me of um, Elizabeth Bird in her book, The Transit of Empire. And I, and I would need to reread it now. I'm just going to be a gross simplification of our argument, but she makes like a very like to me like lethal critique of post-structuralism and post-colonialism, and especially in this like kind of, in this case in, the, in this like in this this. 
that, that comes from this idea of like the, the pre-capitalist or the indigenous. But at the same time, then what is produced are like concepts that underground for like actual indigenous people are very impractical for them. Because you talk about the rise of Matic, deterritorialization, or planetary intersection, it's all like great. But at the same time, on the ground, tactically, politically, and within a settler colonial context, which is all about land, indigenous people in a country need to be str to strongly territorialize, strongly anchor themselves to territory in a way that is quite contrary to these concepts. Instead of like ideas of fluidity and all these things, like what really needs to be asserted is like the idea of conflict. So I'm so that's where I see like I think good great potential I think in the idea of, in the idea of autonomy in this context. Like how can we use or articulate this idea of autonomy that uh, would be like in recognition for this kind of I think important critique of post-colonialism, post-structuralism and these kind of uh, either global or planetary ideas about exchange flow and all these things. So Bruno and I have been talking about uh, indigeneity as a concept that, well, has its affordances, but also uh, there's also a pitfall there. And since I, I feel this is one of the, the categories that we could be discussing in this transnational knowledge exchange, uh, uh, level, I uh, I would like to maybe hear some more of you uh, about how do, do you see this potentially uh, overlapping with the idea of a pan uh, of Americanité. I don't know how this would translate into uh, English Canadian. Uh, academic discussions, but uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that we were talking about yesterday is just this overlapping of Americanité and uh, pan Amerindianness. And so maybe someone else wants to comment on that? Just a comment off the top of my head. The relations between the Americas, or I don't know exactly what the English word would be, but the North-South hemispheres, let's just say that for now, North and South America, let's call them as a category, T to talk about A, indi indigeneity, but also knowledge exchange is very different, it seems to me, I'm, I'm sure I'm right actually, is very different from talking about knowledge exchange or transnationalisms between, for example, North America and Europe very different, extremely different. And and so uh, the, the, the conversation to begin with is inflected. It's inflected in a particular way, and the better we understand that, the more we can talk to each other. It is a very different conversation with, with specificities that do not obtain when North Americans think about Europe, when North Americans think about Asia, when North Americans think about the South Pacific, for example. The, it is a hemispheric conversation. It's not that it doesn't include those, of course it does. All I'm saying is, in this particular case, when a Canadian talks to a Brazilian, there are certain specific contexts that, that, that they don't govern, but they, they attend to the conversation. Embraer, for example. Absolutely. <laughs> and in Embraer, for example. Yes. Or Brazilian yes. Light Interaction, for example. And etc., etc., etc. Of course, of course. And, and concepts of the indigenous, as well, are, are uh, inflected by, by what Canadians think they know about indigeneity and what Brazilians think they know or think or imagine. And that is different from saying that we have a global, universal perspective. You know what I mean? That's, so your, your question's a very good one. I don't know what the answer is, but the question's a very good one. I would say to you that there's, uh, there's another dimension to that question because uh, if you're speaking of indigeneity, then you're bypassing the nation. And I think you're 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 calling attention to the nation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I mean that's why I stress the footnote with James Clifford, you know, saying that Trans-Pacific is not the same as Black Atlantic, and that we have to be aware of these localities. And that's why I think we do need translocal 
as well as transnational. Exactly. Though, of course, you will have indigenous nations in Canada adopting the term nation strategically, even though it may mean differently than um, European concepts. So transnational still has a place. Uh, I used a lot of different trans words in the paper, and I think there's a danger of, of trying to make that, that word do too much work for you. You can't just say translocal, transnational, transhemispheric, and hope the work is done. But at least it's a, a sign that there's some problems, there's some differences. The nation itself is always already the trans nation, as Bill Ashcroft puts it. <laughs> and that we have a very different way now of um, thinking these concepts together because yes, we bypass the nation in our theorizing, but we still, <laughs> we still are part of the nation. We have at least one person who wasn't able to make it here because of his nation and this nation and because of the difficulty of visas and travel uh, nowadays. So we still need to constantly <coughs> work across these concepts, but I think that we wanted the um, this indigenous panel here, uh, because the indigenous certainly in Canada is emerging as a, you know, a huge, hugely important challenge to a lot of conventional ways of, of thinking, and it's also it's also certainly being embraced, I think, theoretically by by, by quite a large number of theorists nowadays. The postcolonial has begun to um, begun slowly to engage with the indigenous and to rethink a lot of its protocols as a result of indigenous challenges and questionings of its assumptions. Um, what I, one thing I really liked about both the films that we were shown was the, um, was the depiction of dance as a different modality of uh, performance. Uh, I've got another article where I talk about Spivak's invocation of the ghost dance, where she argues that the ghost dance failed and I think because of talking to Lynn Mario in part, uh, that, that that's a misjudgment. I don't think the ghost dance has failed. And I think if you read some uh, indigenous theorists like Sakesh Henderson, for example, the ghost dance is a very potent challenge to uh, Western notions of linearity and temporality. Uh, it's a way of connecting to ancestors that can't be just sent back to the past, but that is actively present today. And there's a lot of dismissing uh, dance in uh, dominant um, post-structuralist theory, even the theory that engages with ethics. So I think uh, autonomy does draw our attention to bio, uh, bio power, to the body, uh, and to rethinking how the body enters into this course in ways that, that we do need to, to follow through. And I think the discussion here has been really productive that way. Uh, I don't think there are certain issues of translation as well, then, of in this non-linearity, because uh, yes. I think we could say, in general, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there is a certain similarity in, uh, the, the, in the degree to which the indigenous is significant in, in, in Canada and in, in Brazil. But in, let's say, in rational neoliberal terms, the indigenous population in Brazil is less than half percent. So, so in, if we look at it in objective terms, taking, taking that into account, then the, we could conclude that the indigenous presence in Brazil is much more significant than in Canada. Contra uh, par uh, paradoxically. <laughs> One thing they say very quickly because it's like archived on new media. <laughs> Just want to make a very quick correction because when I was mentioning Elizabeth's bird book, A Transit of Empire, it's actually not Elizabeth Bird, but Jody Bird. So, correction made for the archive. <laughs> <laughs>